Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning at the journey. Start making your way towards your seats. Because whenever I say good morning after I've come up here, it really it doesn't really mean good morning at all. It means move to your seats. It's kind of, right? It's, it's just a nice way of, of doing that. Uh, but usually with journey folk, I have to get rude at some point and just tell you what to do because you don't pay attention to me when I just say good morning. Anyway, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Um, and if you want, you can go ahead and flip over to Hebrews 10 as well and just kind of hold your finger there. We'll get there um, right after. We're going to get started with the text and then do some work. Hebrews 6, beginning in verse 1. The writer says to this house church of Christians, Jewish believers in the Messiah Jesus, he says, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. It's a pretty frightful passage of Scripture. This is known as one of the um, warning passages in the book of Hebrews, one of several, but certainly six. And then the next passage we'll read in just a minute are two of the most prominent warning passages in all of the Bible. So now turn to Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and the fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy and uh, on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As I said last week, it's kind of um, an intimidating prospect to uh, explain these passages of Scripture. Um, They are admittedly hard. Uh, They are hard in their tone. Uh, These texts seem to be uh, postured in such a way where we we feel the the threat, ultimately, of these texts. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. There are some, according to these texts, who are going to experience um, judgment and be cast into a lake of fire. We remember the text from last week in Matthew chapter 7 where many will say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And they give their list of religious accomplishments and he says, I, I, don't, I don't know you, depart. Uh, and these people are cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. And these are people who would say, Lord, Lord. They're people who went to church week in and week out. And so we can know that from the posture of these warning passages, they are indeed for us. We don't walk in here and go, well, I'm, I'm part of the elect of God. I know I'm a Christian, and so these texts just simply aren't for me. This could never happen to me, and so we skate over them and move on. 
But the case I've been trying to make really since we started the book of Hebrews uh, and especially about four weeks ago when I started in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. If you didn't hear the two messages from that text, please go back and catch those. And then again, the message from last week as well. The case I'm making is that God's intention through these warning passages is that those who would call themselves believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should pay very close attention to these texts because it is through the warnings in these texts that God God uses them as a means to help us persevere so that our faith will endure to the end. Jesus says things uh, repeatedly like those who endure to the end will be saved. The book of Revelation says those who are overcomers will not be hurt by the second death. So these texts are for us to, in, to cause us to endure, to cause us to, to persevere. Now, by way of introduction, I want you to consider for just a minute that, that you're on a, um, a vacation trip. And you're on your way to a, a, a vacation destination. It's a wonderful place. You can't wait to get there. You've heard lots about it. It's an amazing place. And so you're on the way. Now, as you're on the way to this incredible vacation destination, there are signs all along the way. And what do we do when we're on a vacation? When we see those signs that point forward to the destination, every time we see them, there's just a little a flip of excitement, isn't there? Those signs, they, they carry a glory, if you will, a reflected glory because of what they point to. They point to the vacation de- destination which is the beach or the mountains or wherever you really love to go and be and and we see those signs we get excited the signs um if you'll imagine in in this scenario the signs are very well done they're they're nice and they're pretty they even seem to lend towards the idea of the wonder of the place that we are going to we follow these signs all the way to the destination Uh, and it is amazing uh, it's it's breathtaking. Maybe it's the mountains and we stand on the edge of that uh, overlook or we're on the top floor of that chalet that we're in and we can see for miles across the mountains. And it, that destination is is awesome. It's breathtaking. It leaves you speechless when you consider the grandeur of the place. Before long, you're enjoying all the wonder that this destination has to offer. But before long... Or after some time, you decide to leave this wonderful destination and go back and admire the signs again. Now, that doesn't sound like a very intelligent thing to do, does it? Uh, because the signs hold a reflective glory to, of the place that they point to. But let's say you, you go back and you admire these signs. Well, at this point, the signs have no glory left at all because we've already experienced the destination. We've already been there. We've been a part of that. We've uh, partaken of its beauty. So we go back and we spend time looking at these signs again instead of enjoying the vacation destination. Now, that's what the people in this confessing house church of Jewish Christians are in danger of doing. They're in danger of going back to admire the signs when they've already received the destination of Jesus Christ. These Jewish Christians, they have the benefit of the whole Old Covenant, which points to Jesus But now they're in danger of slipping back to a place where they would go back and hang out in those old forms of worship. Those old signs that pointed forward to the fulfillment that would be had in Jesus Christ. They're in danger of slipping back into these old forms because these old forms might help them to escape persecution. I don't have to talk about Jesus so much if they go back into the old Jewish forms of worship, which at that time uh, were actually protected by law. And so they would escape some of this, um, some of the persecution they were uh, experiencing. The writer of Hebrews is communicating clearly that you can't go back to these old forms. 
if you go back, uh, um, if you go back, you you lose the destination. You lose Jesus, who is the destination. He is salvation. He is the glory of God revealed. The Bible says he's the radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature. And if you go back to the old forms, you're going back to something that's lost its relevance. You don't need the signs anymore once you've arrived at the destination. So the author uh, of this book, the writer of this book, is making the point that Jesus is better than all of the old forms. He's better than the old ways of worship. And the big problem which gets introduced in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, is that they've grown dull of hearing about the destination. They've grown dull of hearing about Jesus. They're no longer amazed by the grace of the story, of the rescue that he brings through his person and work. They're just not listening. They're not paying very much attention not amazed by the gospel anymore. And so as a result, Hebrews 5 says that their ability to discern good from evil has been compromised, and now they're making all kinds of concessions to the world. We spent a couple of weeks thinking about how we've made concessions to the world. Those were a couple of, I think, pretty hard messages for us to stomach and think through. We've made all of these concessions to the world and our discernment doesn't work so well anymore if we are not drenched in the word of God, if we're not in it, reading it, praying it, pleading its promises, then we're growing dull uh, to the work of Christ around us. So we need to wake up. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 tell us we need to wake up because just ahead on the river of life is a 200-foot drop called judgment. Just ahead is this drop. And so we need to wake up. We need to wake up and make sure that we are not holding fast to the things of the world, the concessions that we've made, that in our dullness we end up going over the falls to our own destruction. So this brings us to today's text. And so I promised you last week we would actually walk through the phrases of Hebrews 6 so that we can get an understanding about what he's talking about. So Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, that, Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. These elementary doctrines about Christ, he says, we need to move on from these things. Now, there's some debate as to what this exactly means, these elementary doctrines about Christ, all of the things that are going to be referred to here in verses 1 and 2. Uh, There's some debate uh, about it, but I I think that a good reading of the Bible, a, a reading of the Bible where Jesus is seen and understood, as the center of everything. When we read the Old Testament, we understand that the Old Testament is really about Jesus, and the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. Any story, anything in the Old Covenant is always pointing to the one who would come and fulfill its requirements. When we read the Bible like this, I think it starts making clear what he means by these elementary doctrines about Christ. I think he's referring to aspects of the Old Covenant system that previously had glory, just go back to the analogy of the signs, these aspects of the old covenant system, they had glory so far as they pointed us to incarnate glory. The signs, the old forms, old aspects of Hebrew worship. They had glory so far as they pointed to the embodiment of glory in Jesus Christ. In fact, I think that each of these phrases that he uses in verses 1 and 2 points to their fulfillment in the high priestly work of Jesus, which has already been discussed and over the next chapters uh, will be explained comprehensively in, in 
uh, chapters 7 through 10 in particular. Now, if you want to understand these things better, you can go back to, we, we did a series the first of the year uh, through the book of Leviticus. To date, one of the, my most favorite uh, series ever. I got to preach a whole sermon on leprosy, and that was just, that's a lot of fun, right? When you think about pus and infectious diseases and things like that. So go back and you can catch some aspect of these old forms of worship. So I think what he's talking about here is pointing towards the high priestly work of Jesus. So if we look there in 6, verse 1 again, he says, we leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Then he says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Six things he mentions there that are all pointing to, I think, aspects from the Old Covenant, signs that held glory as they pointed to Jesus. So let's look at each one of these signs in turn, and we'll try to move through them pretty quickly. Let's consider the idea of repentance from dead works, he said. We're going to move on past the, these elementary foundational doctrines, um, the repentance from dead works. Well, repentance from dead works would point forward to Jesus as the one through whom the substance of repentance would be offered. Jesus preached, repent, and believe the gospel. But when you and I repent, which means to turn our backs on sin, to confess it, ask forgiveness for it, turn from it, and move towards Jesus, when we repent, that is a clear pointer. And it was for Moses and Abraham. It was a clear pointer towards the one who would actually take the penalty that sin deserved so that repentance could be had. We couldn't have the forgiveness of sins. Moses couldn't have the forgiveness of sins unless Jesus would come and die for his sins. So this repentance from dead works points us forward to what Jesus would do as he would um, take the penalty that sins deserve. So the gift of repentance, that Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that repentance is a gift, this gift was secured or made possible by the work of Jesus on the cross. So the repentance from dead works is an Old Testament form of worship that would have its fulfillment in Jesus who provides the substance of repentance. Now consider the phrase, Faith towards God. This was an element of the Old Covenant which corresponds directly uh, to the now revealed object of faith. Who who is the now revealed object of faith? Well, Jesus is, is the revealed object of faith. Not revealed in the Old Covenant, but revealed fully and completely in the New Covenant. So when he talks about this moving on from this faith towards God, we need to think of it in the Old Covenant sense of those believers, Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, those people believed God. What did they believe? They believed that God was faithful to keep his promises. They didn't know who Jesus was. They knew someone was coming, but it's all they knew. They didn't understand the full substance of Christ, but they knew that God was faithful to keep his promises. And so they had faith towards God that he would keep his promises. Well, what, what was the ultimate promise fulfillment? Jesus showed up, right? The ultimate promise fulfillment in the Old Covenant is that someone will come and and take the stroke of justice that is due to your sin and will give you the life that he would ultimately build for you. In the Old Covenant, these people believed God, and the Bible says it was reckoned to them as righteousness. Galatians 3, 6 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted or reckoned to him as righteousness righteousness what did they believe they believed that god was faithful and that he would keep his promises so this is that which uh, faith towards god uh, leads to it points to it's a sign that points to belief ultimately in jesus christ the next sign he gives us is the sign of instructions about washings if you remember in 
in Leviticus, uh, we talked a lot about their, their ceremonial and purification system. They had to wash for everything because you could get dirty by everything. Everything brought some kind of impurity, some kind of defilement. If you uh, touched a dead person or a dead animal, uh, I- anything like that would, would bring impurity. If you were around someone with a, a disease, then you could be impure. If you had a skin disease yourself, then you were considered impure. Um, if you ha- were guilty of any sexual misconduct, you were impure. And not just sexual misconduct, but even if you had uh, enjoyed God's uh, design for sex in a biblical way, you were still impure for a while. So there were all of these impurities that came about through normal day-to-day living, not just sinful things. And so they had to wash all the time. Well, certainly we can think of what these washings would point forward to, right? Jesus who would wash us in his blood and we would be forever pure. So Jesus could say to his disciples in John chapter 17, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And so the instructions about washing, their, their fulfillment, the, the substance of their content was Jesus who would wash them forever in his blood. You see, the point is that we as people are, are dirty and need cleansing in order to be in a relationship with God. And he said these were foundational, elementary things in the Old Covenant. We leave those Old Covenant signs because Jesus is here and he has made us clean. Then there's the laying on of hands, the laying on of hands. This refers to the ordination of priests under the old covenant who mediated that covenant. In the old covenant, you needed priests. You needed lots of priests because there were lots of people and lots of sin that needed to be atoned for. And so the whole sacrificial system was set up by God so that people could experience the forgiveness of sins because those animals pointed forward to another death. Whose death was that? That's what. Whose death was that? Jesus' death. And so these priests were critical to the the program. And so there was an ordination of priests. Their hands would be laid on them and, and, and prayers would be had so that these men who had come of age could now become priests in the service of Almighty God. Well, this would surely point forward to another ordination. Jesus is baptized and the Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove demonstrating here's the one true high priest. He's the high priest and he's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So leave this whole idea of you need a human priest through the laying on of hands and recognize that you have Jesus Christ who's the one true high priest ordained by God himself. you, you got to press on past these things. He's saying don't revert back to these old ideas, these old forms, these old signs. And then we have the the last phrase, speaking of two things, the resurrection of the dead and final judgment. Both both of these things are promised in the Old Covenant, and both of these things point again to Jesus. You see, Jesus would provide the ground for resurrection by himself doing what? Raising from the dead. Where does the resurrection come from that we hope to attain to? By the fact that Jesus Christ could not be held by sin and death. And so this points forward to the fact that in the book of Psalms it says you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He's not even going to be in that tomb very long. He's going to come back. He's going to rise with authority and power. And so the resurrection speaks forward or points forward to Jesus who would rise and provide for the immortality of our souls, that we would be raised with him. And then final judgment, of course, referred to a test that must be passed. A test that must be passed. Make no uh, mistake, there is a test at the end of your life. There is a test at the end of your life. And whether or not you have passed that test will determine whether or not you spend eternal life in glory with God. The great 
hope of the Christian is that Jesus takes the test for us. The great hope of the Christian is that Jesus stands before the bar of God and says, I have fulfilled all the law for him. And so judgment, final judgment, even points forward to the only means whereby we can pass the test through Jesus. They would need an advocate, and Isaiah 53 tells us of the one who would pay for their failures and make the many righteous. He would cause us to pass the test. So every phrase in these two verses refers to signs from the Old Covenant that now completely give way to the fullness of form in Jesus Christ. He's our vacation destination. He's where we arrive at. He's the one that we're supposed to be mesmerized with uh, until we go to be with him and become like him. And he says, press on past these old things. Don't revert back to those things. So how is it that these things are relevant for us? Probably not many of you are tempted to go back to Old Testament rituals of ceremony and purification. Are you? I mean, have any of you thought this past week that, I mean, you you need to make sure that you're clean from um, uh, some impure thought and so you have to go wash to get clean of these impurities? Have any of you wanted to uh, observe Jewish feasts or festivals this past week? So what do these things have to do with us? Well, at the core, at the core of these things in verses 1 and 2 is a temptation to revert back to a moral code. It's a temptation to revert back to a moral code as our confidence And and this is how we can find very specific application for us. Because so much of the Christian life, I mean, we want confidence, don't we? We want security. We want assurance. In fact, we can make the case that all of what I'm preaching about last week and this week is ultimately about assurance. It's about the confidence of knowing that we are in him. And so many times we misplace our confidence and we think that through adherence to some moral or religious code, if we're obedient and we do well enough, then then we can have confidence, we can have assurance that we're doing well. Or if you're not obedient to your own moral code or someone else's, then you live in condemnation and shame all the time because you're not doing well. So what seems maybe irrelevant is intensely relevant for us. Are we applying rules to our own lives and rules to other people? That this is the way they would be counted righteous? It's easy for us to find safety and security in the rules. We like order. More than that, we like to make our own order and expect for everyone else to conform to it. And he's saying you can't revert back to these kinds of things. You can't revert back to these kinds of things. Uh, Anytime we try to promote our way as the right way, it just sets us up for one radical disappointment after another. But if we want true confidence, we have to look outside of ourselves. If we want true assurance, we have to look outside of ourselves. Jesus is our confidence. He is our confidence assurance and falling away from him as such is a terrifying thing to consider falling away from our confidence falling away from our security for from certainty and assurance falling away from these things is a terrifying thing and so we move now in our text to the explicit danger of falling away the explicit danger of falling away. Verse 4, he says, For it's impossible in the case of those who have... And he lists off a series of things here. It's impossible in the case of those who've once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who've shared in the Holy Spirit, 
have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. Uh, he, he talks about a group of people here. He's talking about a class, if you will, of people that these things would be considered true of. And all of those things sound like saving things. All of those things sound like the condition or experiences of people who have come into faith in Jesus Christ. So how are we supposed to understand these things? There's, there's two ways, traditionally, to understand the condition that's being described in these two verses. Number one, these are truly converted people, and therefore they can lose their salvation. Secondly, these are not truly converted people, and the phrases do not refer to genuine articles of conversion. I have a hard time with, with both of those things because those things sound like articles of conversion to me it sounds like these are people who they're in right so i'm going to opt for a slightly different third view here's the third view this is a group of people that's being or this group of people that's being described they're described as demonstrating all of the marks of true Christianity so far as anyone can tell. So far as anyone can tell. Not only that, but a group of people uh, being described here as demonstrating all the marks of true Christianity so far as any individual in that group can tell about themselves. They would look at this and think they're in. They would look and think that they have shared in the Holy Spirit, that they've been enlightened, that they've tasted the goodness of the Word of God, that they've tasted the heavenly gift and the powers of the age to come. So far as anybody can tell, they're in this group, this class of, con of Christian people. Now, to help you understand where I'm going, I want you to consider consider an Old Testament context for a minute. When the people of God, Israel, whenever they left Egypt during the Exodus, which of the people believed they were the true people of God? The answer? All of them did. Those who walked across on dry land through the Red Sea when it parted. And then they watched the Egyptians destroyed behind them. If you would ask, which of you are the people of God? They all would have raised their hand. So far as anyone could tell, so far as they could tell, they just come through this great baptism with the waters rising up over them. They are, they're God's people. Which of them drank water from the rock and was sustained by it? All of them did. Which of them ate manna that was provided by God every day? All of them did. Which of them believed God and it was reckoned to them as righteousness? Some of them did. Some of them did. All of them came through the Red Sea. All of them were delivered from Egypt. All of them ate the manna. All of them drank water from the rock. They were all part of the visible people of God. But only some of them believed, and it was reckoned to them as righteousness. In the Old Testament, we have a, a term, a, a word referring to that group of people. It, it's known as the remnant. You have a great group of people, and then there are a remnant of the truly converted. Many of those who were of the people of Israel were not the true Israel of God. Hebrews 3 makes the case that their bodies fell in the wilderness because of unbelief, and yet they were part of visible Israel. Visibly, they were part of the people of God. 
They would go through the motions of worship just like everyone else. They would go to temple worship. They would obey the ceremonies. They would do all of these things in the law. Just like many of the people who receive the word and respond with immediate joy, but do not persevere through trial. That story is told in the New Testament, the parable of the soils. Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 says some hear the gospel. They respond to it immediately with joy. They, they spring up. Their, their plant of conversion, if you will, springs up. Looks good on the face of it so far as anyone can tell. They are in the elect. They are in the redeemed group. It's just like John said in 1 John chapter 2, that not all persevere. Verse uh, 19 of chapter 2, he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. They left because they're not of us. If they were of us, they would have remained. Their faith would endure. They would persevere. But they left demonstrating they are not of the remnant. They are not of the true people of God. Throughout all of history, uh, since Jesus, there has been, and even before with Israel, there have been the visible people of God and the invisible people of God. Many of the visible people of God demonstrate all kinds of traits and characteristics and things that so far as anybody can tell, they're redeemed people. Paul referred to two men named Hymenaeus and Alexander, who no doubt started extremely well and showed great um, potential, and yet they made shipwreck of the faith. Just like Saul in the Old Testament, when during his earthly kingship, he seemed to do the will of God and seemed to accept the rule of God, but later would show by his life that he rejected God's way. So much so that God tells his prophet Samuel, don't even pray for Saul anymore. I've rejected him. Now hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. No elect child of God can ever be lost. No elect child of God can ever be lost. There are other texts that condition our understanding of Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Texts like Romans chapter 8 verses 29 through 30 where we have this unbroken chain between those who are predestined, then called, then justified, and glorified. All who get justified get glorified. Nobody falls through the cracks. John chapter 6 where Jesus says he will not lose a single one that God has given him. But I think it's interesting to note that when he says that, I think he's talking about, um, I think there's, a, there's a, a first meaning and then there's a second meaning. The first meaning is, is those that are with him right then on the earth, his disciples. He says, I won't lose any of those that you've given me. And he says this before Judas falls away. Well, what do we know then about Judas? He was not given. God had not given him Judas, even though that Judas was part of the visible group following Jesus, and so far as anyone could tell, he was one of them, in spirit and in truth. But the elect children of God are demonstrated to be so by their imperfect but final perseverance. Imperfect but final perseverance. We know the elect by their persevering faith. Many begin well. Many, as our text says, uh, later in chapter 6, verse 7, for land that has drunk the rain. A lot of people sit in church week in and week out. 
drinking the rain of God's preached word, drinking the rain of the gospel that falls down and saturates and sits in this wonderful uh, uh, this context of grace and mercy where the work of Jesus Christ is preached is all sufficient. Many people sit under that rain week in and week out. They hear the gospel. It was even understood by them to some degree. And to everybody around watching, it seemed like they got it. Like they understood. They seemed joyful and receptive. And then they fell away. Almost always by degrees. If you'll remember from last week, I said we don't get into the condition of, of, of this close to perishing. We don't get into this condition overnight. It's a falling away by degrees. And then he says about this group. He says about this group who, so far as anyone could tell, have the marks of true conversion. He says, if they fall away, it is impossible to restore them again to repentance. That's really scary. That's really scary, right? It's impossible to restore them again to repentance. I can only conclude one thing from this uh, expressed in a couple of different ways. That those who fall away in the manner of this text, and I do think that, that the manner of this falling away is specific. I think the manner of this falling away is specific. We have to consider the context of who he's talking about. These are Jewish Christians or Jewish confessing believers. They're, they're thinking about reverting back and saying that Jesus in his sufficiency, I, I don't want that anymore. So this is a, a particular kind of falling away. Those who fall away in this manner will never seek repentance. I can conclude that from this text. Those who fall away in this manner will never seek repentance or that those who fall away in this manner are committing what Jesus calls blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because we only have given in the scriptures one unforgivable sin. Jesus says every sin committed by people can be forgiven. Except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Which is a persevering disbelief in Jesus and his work as divine. It's to attribute to Jesus the status of common. Maybe even to attribute the status of Jesus as evil. Because look at, look at what he says about this group of people who, who can't be restored to repentance. He says, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now I really struggle. What does it mean? I, that, what does that mean? mean i mean jesus isn't dying all over again most assuredly through the disbelief and the rejection uh, the blasphemy of people against christ and his work he's not being crucified again and yet he says they're that they're crucifying him um once again the son of god to their own harm what does this mean it means that they would consider the crucifixion of jesus christ as having been either a terrible misunderstanding or his just desert they would hold him up again to contempt by saying he was common his i don't need his death those who would persevere in disbelief uh, in jesus and his work as divine would say that his death had no saving efficacy for anybody Jesus' work couldn't make anybody clean. Jesus' work couldn't um, give anybody relationship with God. And so they would be saying he was just a man. That's to, uh, that's to hold the Son of God to contempt. That's to crucify him. Again, is to consider his crucifixion to have been a just thing that 
he deserved or either just a misunderstanding. So what's clear to me from this text is that those who fall away in this manner do not and cannot seek repentance. They do not and cannot seek repentance. Now, I think we have to be very careful, very careful, not to try and make case studies for this. Let me explain what I mean. Let's say you know some 18-year-old boy or girl, and they grow up in the church all of their life, and they seem, so far as anybody can tell, to be Christian people. And they go away to university, and... Uh, They spend a few years there and maybe take some philosophy courses and whatever else. And within two or three years, they're just full-blown agnostic or, or, or even an atheist. And we would go, that's, that's the kid this verse is talking about. And I would say we should be very careful about trying to make judgments and say, yeah, this guy's a case study for this text. This guy proves this text. No, you don't know. You don't know. Because we also know stories. Pastor Bill, here at the journey, left a Christian home, went to college, came out a full-blown atheist. And yet it is clear that he has been restored again to repentance. He is one of God's children and leading well here in this place. We can't make case studies. So somebody would ask, is the person in my illustration, uh, is that the person that is being talked about? I don't know. That is the point. I nor you can tell. I nor you can tell. Um, The odds show that probably some of your children will grow up and leave the faith. I have five children. The odds are good is that, that one of them walks away from the faith my hope would be that they'd come back my hope would be that they would come back that they would endure to the end we know these stories of people who have returned who have been restored to repentance but those who apostatize in the manner of this text cannot be restored to repentance what I know is this if you are in the faith so far as anyone can tell then your focus should be on persevering if you're in the faith so far as anyone can tell your focus should be on persevering continue the spiritual cycle of repentance and faith in the gospel Could this happen to you? I don't know. I don't know. Can this happen to the elect of God whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world? No. But we are all saved so far as anyone can tell. It is an enduring persevering faith that demonstrates who the elect are we don't take confidence we don't hold our confidence in the doctrine of election in such a way that we do not evaluate ourselves to see if we are in the faith paul tells us several times in the epistles test yourselves to see if you are in the faith ask hard questions What is it that can bring this condition about? The answer in Hebrews chapter 5 verses 11 through 14 is this. A continued neglect of the word of God. He says you've become dull of hearing. You don't want to hear. You don't want to be taught. Your discernment has now become so weak that you can't tell right from wrong anymore. You're making all of these compromises with the world. And by degrees, one falls away. I think I said last week that dullness of hearing uh, is halfway on the scale 
of boiling to death. Apostasy is falling away by degrees. Last Sunday evening, uh, I had a conversation with one of the men in our church that got me thinking. His question, uh, or comment, I guess, involved knowing where is the line of falling away? Where, where's the line at? How can we know? I think that the devil would love to hook us into thinking like this a lot. I think he'd love to hook us into thinking like this a lot. He would love to destroy our confidence. He would love to destroy our confidence. And you may think that the net result of what I've been preaching the past several weeks, you might think that the net net result of that is to destroy our confidence. But my intention is exactly the opposite. My intention is to help you to have an unshakable confidence in the power of God to hold your salvation secure. That's what I want to help establish. And in so doing, I might shake up. I might shake up a lot of our false securities, false confidences, false saviors, false belief systems. But I want to see unshakable confidence in the people of God that they are securely held by God for a salvation ready ready to be revealed in the last days. That's what I want to do. If you're the elect of God, then Jesus unalterably secured your salvation. It can't be changed. He did that when he fulfilled the demands of the law on your behalf. He did that when he took all of your sin on himself and received the penalty for your sin uh, uh, that was due you by dying on the cross. He did that, uh, or he, I'm sorry, he declared then that he'd done it when he arose from the grave victorious over sin and death, saying that these things absolutely cannot hold us. He has stripped sin's power forever to hold us in its chains. Jesus did these things. He's accomplished these things. It's not a work in progress. It's not up in the air. He finished it on the cross. However, the application of his finished work is applied in the, in the lives of the elect right now. Right now. We are prone to put our confidence in a past act like saying the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer did not save any of you. Not a single one. You might have said it. It didn't save you. Jesus Christ saved you on the cross. It was applied at a point in time when you were justified by faith. And now he continues saving you now. And Jesus does not want us to live with confidence in a past act. He wants you to live in the light of his finished work now. So when I think about where is the line of apostasy, I should quickly quickly get myself out of thinking like this and to decide to live in the now of Jesus' finished work applied real time. Which is why we always say in this church, you'll never hear us really say anything different, that, that the whole of the Christian life is repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. There is no other alternate route. There are no further steps. Repentance and faith faith this is how we live in the now of jesus's once and for all finished work right now i can believe that jesus did everything necessary to save me which means he is saving me not just he did save me now someone might ask what about the moments of unbelief what about the moments that 
that we're not believing the gospel because ultimately when we sin, we're not believing the gospel. What about those moments? Is, is Christ's finished work holding me through my unbelief? Certainly. Certainly. I got a text to prove it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. He says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But get the, this last part. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. So when I recognize my faithlessness, right there at my side, there is a gift ready and waiting to be used all over again for the 10,000th time. That gift is repentance. It's the gift that never quits giving. And so any time, any place we are ever at in the Christian faith, when our confidence is shaken to the core, what you have at your disposal right then is repentance and faith. So we shouldn't get caught up in all of these uh, questions about where is the line of apostasy. I know it's, it's easy to hang out there and to live in, in places of fear. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a, a spirit of a sound mind and of power. A spirit of faith. I am drinking in the rain that falls on me and producing a crop useful to my master for whose sake it is cultivated. And so I receive blessings from God. That's putting myself right there in verse 7 of Hebrews 6. I'm drinking in the rain. I'm hearing the gospel. He's turning me to repentance and faith continually. And I receive blessings from God for it. The question gets asked, well, how long can I go in faithlessness? How long can I persist in rebellion before apostasy occurs? That's kind of like asking, how far can I go with my girlfriend before it's sin? They're not good questions. They're not good questions. The thing for me to know is that Jesus' finished work is available to me right now. And so I believe it. Turn away from sin and believe the gospel afresh. So I want to live in the now. I don't want to live in a past experience. Sanctification now is justification past applied and the new creation embraced. That's what sanctification is now, and it's changing me. It's changing you. We sin? Absolutely. Yes, the biblical writers sin. In fact, the story of the biblical writers is that they were spiritual flops much of the time. Abraham, the great father of our faith, passed his, sister, or his wife off twice as his sister so that he wouldn't get in trouble. Out of fear. They were always blowing it and always repenting and believing. The intention of this text is for people who are in the faith so far as anyone can tell, including themselves, to live in the gospel work of Jesus' life through repentance and faith. To live in that work. Walk in the gospel. Dwell in the gospel. You cannot, get this, you cannot apostatize if you walk in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You hear that? You, you want to know where confidence is at? You want to know where security? You cannot apostatize if you, through faith and repentance, walk in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's our confidence. So when we are living in a manner of speaking where we seem to be far, far afield from the finished work of Jesus Christ, confidence will be and should be shaken. 
And we need to ask, am I dull of hearing? Am I halfway on the scale of boiling to death? Let's pray. Father, we preach this way because we are passionately concerned about the salvation of our souls. We are passionately concerned that each and every one of us be found in Him. Not living with confidence in some past act and so maybe deluding myself about present reality. Confidence in some past experience that may or may not be fact at all. 